I really appreciate you guys showing up to the uh, Friday afternoon keynote. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's had a pretty uh, hectic week, and so you know, I appreciate you guys uh, sticking around. Um, as Sebastian mentioned, you know, my name is Lon Lundgren, uh, CEO of a company called Ocelot. I spent the last several years at AWS and Microsoft before that, and I left to sort of take uh, the, the things that I've been thinking about with cloud, along with some special ingredients I think blockchain brings to the table. Uh, and uh, went off to go build this. So kind of the big picture of what we're going to talk about is that the cloud has literally terraformed the planet Earth. And uh, that might be a bold statement to make. You know, we'll throw out a few of the facts and figures. But we're talking about a resource that, you know, backs almost everything that's built today. And in order to do that and deliver that to everybody across the globe, like, a lot's taken place. Uh, the cloud is also, I believe, evolving to be a fundamental utility. You can't really have something that everybody depends on and not end up having it be a utility, at least not with things going pretty awry. And then, you know, I also am a strong believer that blockchain is part of the answer and what's going to be the future of how uh, the cloud looks. So in order to kind of go forward and talk about the cloud, you got to kind of go back to the beginning. And in the beginning of the cloud, there was actually this really great idea, right? The great idea was don't build your own data centers, don't operate your own servers, just use ours. And you know, pay by the hour and only pay for what it is that you use. And then like the best part, which is like pick up and leave any time that you want, because hey, you know, it's just servers. And you know what? It's just open source software most of the time on servers and it's just Linux. It was actually a pretty great promise. If you think about what's happened in the last decade, an entire economy has exploded in the software as a service space. Uh, companies are born overnight. I mean, people can literally go to a hackathon and at the end of the weekend of the hackathon can have a new company. And you know, that is pretty awesome. But if we fast forward to the cloud of today, you know, things are a little bit different. And if you think about it, there's kind of some pathologies that come along with the cloud. And the pathologies stem from the idea of you have something that's so completely viral and you let it kind of keep growing unchecked, uh, some unintended consequences are sort of going to arise. And you know, one of the main reasons for this is that the cloud providers have a set of incentives that are different than our incentives building on top of the cloud. And the main incentive is profit maximization. This incentive is driven by going and maximizing the profit that's then fed to the shareholders. And so what that causes the cloud provider to do is the cloud provider is going to turn every single new capability they think of into a new service that they can charge you for. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, having more and more and more services uh, starts to get to become a bit of a headache. And you know, to think about how ridiculous things are getting, we're getting to a point where we're talking about adopting additional services to help us manage the complexity of services that we already have, adopting services from external companies to help us optimize the services that we have, to help us even find the crap that's in the cloud. Like to me, this is, this is, this is kind of nuts. And um, you know, I think kind of the core of the big problem is that because of the way that the incentives are structured for the cloud, I mean, they have the ultimate paradox of the innovator's dilemma. Right? They are not there to go introduce more features to the existing product line that they have because they have to keep growing their business and they don't want to cannibalize the opportunity to have a new business by not introducing to you a new service when they could just fix the ones they have. It's just not really the way it goes. Um, one kind of funny aside, when I think about the Indiana Jones archaeologist of the future, I imagine Jane showing up and saying, hey, we found that instance that's been on that bill for five years that you couldn't find in that one region. We finally located it. This is kind of how I feel like as a cloud user today. I don't know if any of you guys uh, identify with that. So uh, really, I think the thing that threatens all of us, all that complexity aside, the thing that we really actually have to fundamentally address is the concept of platform risk. And I think everybody's heard platform risk before, but just to kind of restate it, you know, platform risk is the idea that you face an existential threat from the supplier that you're built on top of uh, in order to go build the service that you're building. And you know, people already know this is a thing. Amazon eats people's lunch all the time. You know, so much so that people feel like they're caught in this catch-22 of building things on top of Amazon and kind of not knowing when the shoe is going to drop. Now, being somebody that used to work at Amazon, I know a little bit about this. And you know, it's pretty simple the way that it goes. And it's kind of like, hey, this is an integral thing that maybe should be part of our platform. Let's go ahead and build that. But what about the customer we have? Well, I don't think we even have that conversation. One thing I think is important to kind of reflect upon here is that, in my opinion, this platform risk is structural in the way that the cloud is set up. It's structural in these businesses. It's structural in the pieces that I already mentioned about 
the incentives for profit maximization, and that means that it can't be fixed with the way the structure is now. There's no version of events where the cloud provider stops to consider the health of the business of their customer who's building something on top of the cloud. Otherwise, why would they go build this new service that might compete with them? So one thing I kind of get a kick out of is that you, know, you have these quotes here from uh, Microsoft and Google. They're pretty hip to the idea that people are scared of Amazon coming and eating their lunch. And so they say, hey, don't worry. We won't be your competitor. But you know what? It's structural there, too. It's not like it's any different. So it's kind of a bit of a, of a hollow promise, and they know it. Uh, one thing I think is interesting to call is when you think about blockchain, blockchain is actually what I would consider to be platform risk resistant. And uh, you know, as a decentralized, trustless technology, I mean, it's slightly immune to part of these problems. But you know what? It is not platform risk proof. It really isn't. And you know, I think that these same cloud providers, nothing malicious, but they're out to eat the blockchain's lunch too, because like, there's a lot of business there. One of the things that I thought about recently is how many people here are familiar with the VDF challenge or familiar with kind of like VDFs in uh, Ethereum? You know, so the, the VDF uh, cryptographic primitive is something that it's an innovation that happened quite quick, I think a little bit before its time, but it's gonna be the basis of allowing us to build decentralized trustless clocks. Like what an important primitive. And then I think about this challenge so that we can go get this technology built and what do you know? You see the names Xilinx and Amazon down at the bottom. And I kind of wonder, What's Amazon so interested in in trying to go help fund this challenge? Well, it's not gonna be too surprising one day when Amazon's like, hey, you need some VDFs? Come over here, we got a few in our data center. You want some? Anyway, don't say I didn't kind of warn you. So, you know, I, I think the, the thing that's a little bit controversial to talk about in this space, but it's just a reality, is that the blockchain deeply depends upon the cloud. That's just the way that it is, right? And we've all kind of seen these stats. We know that there's a lot of Ethereum nodes that are running in the cloud. We know there's a concentration of them in AWS in particular. But you know, it's not about picking on uh, Ethereum specifically. I mean, Bitcoin is not in much better shape. And you know, the number I have here is uh, about the concentration of Bitcoin nodes in Hetzner. And these are just the top number one and two blockchains. I mean, really, pretty much all the blockchains have the same problem, which is uh, the cloud is kind of where things end up. So, you know, like, why is that? I mean, the truth of the matter is, we're talking about an industry that's on its way to being trillions of dollars in size. And, you know, it's kind of fun to think about an industry that's this big, but then we don't really kind of dig into the details to see what does it take to have something that's one and a half trillion dollars, right? And uh, in order to have a business that's one and a half trillion dollars, we're talking about the major tech providers moving to own all of the undersea cables and data transit. We're talking about cloud providers that have hundreds of data center locations across dozens of geographic regions, and they're still going. And even though we don't have the exact numbers, we're talking about cloud providers that have hundreds of millions of servers. So even though some people like to you know, have this nice fantasy that they're running a few things and they're not in the cloud, maybe they're in your own data center. The reality is the statistics say that, sure, even if your stuff isn't in the cloud, eight other people like you, their stuff is. When I go and you know, back to this idea about what it means to what we have done to our planet, we sort of terraform planet Earth, you know, another interesting thing that I think about is, one day we're going to go colonize other planets. And when we go colonize other planets, we're going to start there by building the fundamental things that we need to survive on those planets first. Those things are gonna be like water, electricity, oxygen, and I'm not gonna be surprised when someone says, hey Bob, go offload those servers off of that rover so we can get that data center built. When you, know, you start thinking about it this way, it seems pretty obvious that the cloud really is a utility. You cannot have a dependency that so much of us rely upon and you know, not have to think about it as a utility. So really, you know, cloud has sort of eaten the world, and uh, why wouldn't it be the same with blockchain? Blockchain's dependence on the cloud is inevitable, and frankly, it's unavoidable. So what really has to happen? What has to happen is, is that we need to think about a different kind of future, a future that's symbiotic with blockchain. And in order for that to take place, I think that we need to consider the possibility that even though the blockchain has a heavy dependence upon the cloud, 
what would we be able to do if we had a cloud that had a heavy dependence upon blockchain? It's funny because when I kind of talk this, uh, this idea of people, they go, blockchain, you know, don't you mean crypto? Like, what about those Bitcoin prices? Isn't that the kind of thing you mean? And, you know, I say, I don't really know about Bitcoin prices. I'm not really a trader. I'm a distributed systems guy. But what I can tell you is it's more than likely that approximately every 10 minutes for the rest of your natural life, there's going to be a block mined. And, you know, that kind of makes me feel like there's a, a fundamental distributed systems primitive that you can depend on that is something that comes out of blockchain. And when I go step 10,000 sort of feet out and I look at blockchain as a whole, I see a lot of fundamental primitives that map to my experience in the distributed system space that come out of blockchain. And when I look at these primitives, the one thing that I see that's a huge advantage is that these are not primitives that already have centralized dependencies built in. So, I mean, where does that sort of leave us? Really, what it's about, it's about building something new. And it's about bootstrapping something from the ground up this concept of going from zero to one. And when you go from zero to one, this is really the hardest part of building anything. And when you're going from zero to one, this is also when you make the choices about the most fundamental dependencies that you are going to depend upon. And these are dependencies that you're never going to be able to get out of your system ever again. So the concept of being able to take some uh, primitives that come from the blockchain space to solve some of these problems, start off in a a position where you're already not building centralized pieces into, into a large system, uh, uh, that's pretty great. So then what about the cloud? What is it that you keep from the cloud? Well, if it was me, I would just take the server sitting in the rack, sitting in the data centers, because really that's the thing all the money's been spent on. And you, know, you can kind of ask, well, that seems a little bit crazy. Don't they have like 150 services in the cloud? Well, that wasn't the original promise that was made. That wasn't the original offering. And having experience as somebody who's built services at AWS, being one of the senior leaders that built Amazon Aurora, I can tell you we had a mandate to use as few services as possible. This is an AWS service that's built using other AWS services, and our mandate is to use as few AWS services as possible when building it. Why is that? It's because every single dependency that you break is something that might later break your system when it breaks. Really not awesome. Kind of a funny story. Uh, I recognize a few of the faces here. Have any of you guys seen the burner machine product that we brought to San Francisco Blockchain Week? Well, we're going to talk about it in a little bit. Uh, this is something we actually built for you guys. So we launched it live here yesterday. And kind of a funny thing, Lev, uh, you know, one of our engineers and I, we were up until 4 a.m. yesterday morning, and this is when we took the wraps off of the product. And then we launched it live so that we can come here and exhibit and show you guys the product. And you know, I got to tell you, we really kind of patted ourselves on the back because we thought it was rock solid. We built something that's dependent upon blockchain. We took out all of the dependencies. There's no dependencies except one. And I'll let you guys guess what that is. So our product that we launched at 4 a.m., 12 hours later at 4 p.m., experienced its first service interruption on its very first day of being live because it's one dependency that it has started to have an interruption. Anyone want to take a guess what that dependency is? Anyone? Did I hear something? Infura. So we built something that talks to the blockchain. In order to talk to the blockchain, it uses Infura to do so. And we ended up talking to the technical co-founder of Infura last night. It was pretty entertaining to have him tell us how they have a fundamental dependency on an AWS service that actually experienced a service interruption as well, and that's why they were experiencing a service interruption, and that's why we were experiencing a service interruption. Now, Infura is a really awesome service. I mean, it's the sort of thing where, you know, I'm very grateful that we have something like this to build on top of with Ethereum. It's, uh, you know, no small business to build a service of that scale. But it really kind of drives the point home. Even when removing almost all the dependencies, you know, still kind of end up with something that uh, bites you in the behind. Anyway, I've kind of talked about all the different little bits and pieces that can get us to this point where we can talk about this concept. It's the concept of introducing an infrastructure substrate. And the idea is, is about being able to project the hardware that comes out of the servers, you know, in these racks, in these data centers, in these cloud providers, move it to this layer, the higher level up, and, you know, pepper in with it some of these uh, distributed systems primitives that will allow us to bootstrap a system that come from blockchain. So this is what we mean when we talk about forking the cloud. This is the concept. 
And it's basically in three easy steps. You know, the first one is keep the hardware from the data centers of the world's largest providers. This is the utility. These cloud providers have spent tens and hundreds of billions of dollars to create this resource, and nobody's gonna go and replace it. So there's nothing wrong with using it, and there's nothing wrong with them being compensated for us using it. It actually makes total sense, right? But now we're talking about compensating them for getting access to a hardware resource, and we're talking about paying them a margin, which is the same sort of margin you would pay a utility provider to get electricity or internet. The second piece is, is to rewire these data centers into a global network topology that becomes part of this substrate. And the last piece is, is to introduce a new nervous system and corporate structure that make it all work. Now, let's pause here for a second because we have all the pieces and let's kind of think about what it is that we've been able to do. With a nervous system that's autonomous, where a lot of the pieces operate as smart contracts where code is law, we're talking about a system whose entire mission and purpose is to perpetuate the operation of the substrate for the purpose of providing service for the pleasure of the people building on top of it, not for profit maximization. Similarly, when we talk about a corporate structure that runs and manages this substrate, we're talking about a corporate structure that does not have shareholders. We're talking about a corporate structure whose mandate and mission is to continue the operation of this substrate at the pleasure and for the benefit of the people using it. So I hope you see now, when we're talking about having there be a platform risk and what it takes to go engineer the platform risk out of the system. We have built something and we're aiming towards building something where it is fundamentally impossible for us to compete with you. And now this is the only way that we can eventually deliver cloud as a utility. This is the only way where platform builders can go build applications and services on top of a substrate where they have access to cloud resources and they do not have to worry about the supplier underneath them one day becoming their competitor. So that's most of what I wanted to share, but I had mentioned about Burner Machine. This is the product that we actually built uh, for you guys and introduced here at San Francisco Blockchain Week. So the idea of this product is we wanted to pull together a number of pieces uh, from the technology that we've been building and kind of bring an outsider's perspective to building something for blockchain. You know, as we understand it, uh, you know, blockchain UX is pretty difficult, and we thought that we might be able to build an experience that would be fun. And, you know, we thought we'd also be able to build something where the use case is more of a mainstream use case, and it's built on top of uh, part of Ocelot's technology. So I'm gonna take a little bit of a gamble, and I'm gonna demonstrate the product to you live. And we have Lev here, who's in the background, he's one of our engineers, okay? And he has a bunch of these, if you're interested. These are ERC20 tokens that we've printed on cards. The back of these cards has a seed phrase, okay? These are not something we're selling. We're not, like I said, we're not a blockchain company. We're not, we're not doing an ICO. We're not selling a token. These are a promotional token so people can get access to our product. And we've tried to build a product that has no back end or dependencies other than talking to the blockchain. So when you go and use our product and you pick a type of machine that you'd like to launch, so I'm gonna go ahead and pick a Windows machine, you pick a place in the world where you want that machine to be launched. I'm gonna launch it in Portland because that's closest to us and it will have a decent kind of experience. And I'm gonna pay with this burner token, okay? I'm now going to type in the phrase of this burner token in front of all of you. No pressure. Do it? I think I did it. Okay. Now, my browser is the one that redeemed this token. Without any other dependency, the browser used the seed phrase to go derive the private key to get access to the token that was associated with this seed phrase, redeemed that token by calling our smart contract and made the request to ask for the burner machine that it wanted, which was a Windows machine in Portland. So. This request is happening, and you know, this is one of our ways of kind of trying to deal with the blockchain UX of having to wait a little while. So we kind of made something for you to do while you wait. I get impatient, I don't know about you guys. I'm sorry that you both, you all can't play with me, but. Anyway, uh, nobody tell Nintendo, all right? 
Besides, we made it purple. That's, that's gotta be good enough. So as you can see while I'm doing this, I'm getting sort of updates um, from the progress of the transaction. The transaction, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the transaction that was sent has you know, been, been mined on the blockchain, and in this transaction that was sent includes the request parameters for the machine. Additionally, in your browser, your browser creates a throwaway set of RSA keys that is used to encrypt the information that's sent back to it. So in your browser is a throwaway set of, a uh oh, we'll just wait there, we'll park it. Uh, so in the browser is a throwaway set of ephemeral keys that are used in this communication. So when it talks to our back end, our back end can send a response that's specifically for your browser and only your browser can decrypt, and yet we still don't know who you are. There's no exchange of IP address, there's no other sort of uh, uh, dependency that's there. I wish the blockchain would go faster right now. Oh, what do you know? So our backend has responded, it went and started the machine that you, uh, that you wanted, it's sent back an opaque blob through the blockchain, which is encrypted with the key that only we can decrypt, and then these are the uh, credentials to go connect to our machine, Moody, Guppy, seems lucky. And there it is, it's a Windows computer in the cloud that's all yours for three hours to do whatever it is that you wanna do with it. I don't know, anyone want me to Google anything? Blockchain. Blockchain. So that's the product. So um, thank you very much for sticking around. Like I said, uh, please come get one of these tokens and as many of them as you want since we have a bunch of them and they were for you guys and uh, I really appreciate you sticking around and uh, listening to my ideas. Thank you. We actually have time for one or two questions if anyone in the audience has a question. So in regards to like a cloud provider, what would a, a cloud provider do to build specifically for the blockchain and not, not providing their own services like AWS or just like build specifically for that? So, um, you know, I think if you kind of read between the lines a little bit about what it is that we're proposing, you'll see that this isn't really in the best interest of the cloud provider. Actually, the answer is a little more nuanced. Behind closed doors at the cloud provider, they know this is where everything's going. They know that eventually the music's gonna stop with trying to go offer people 150 different services that get you twisted into a pretzel that you'll never be able to get out of and let you move to another cloud provider. They know fundamentally that that hardware and those data centers and the networking that connects it all together, that's the real utility. And they know eventually there's going to have to be another layer to make more of it interoperable. So this would be tantamount to a cloud provider rushing to go build some of this today, which eventually would cut themselves out of the equation, which they're not rushing to do. So, you know, again, they sort of know it's inevitable. They're not trying to hasten it. They're not really trying to teach people how to do it but they're not gonna stop it because it's kind of the natural next set of steps that are gonna take place. Does that, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, so if you uh, actually look at you know, things like Google's doing right now, Google has uh, been very gung-ho about supporting the open source movement around containerization and the Kubernetes project. And if you look at some of the stuff that they're selling, they're saying, hey, we'll give you a managed Kubernetes, and in this managed Kubernetes, this stuff can run in AWS or it can run in Microsoft, and they're helping to facilitate that. So if you think about it, you know, they're not the market leader, and they don't really have a lot to lose by doing this. They're trying to gain market share. The way that I kind of think about it is, they're all rushing to gain as much market share as they can until kind of this game of musical chairs stops, and then basically things look this different way. And so, yeah, the companies like Google are doing this. You know, Microsoft has a few of their own things. Eventually, like you said, if you can't beat them, join them. You know, uh, Amazon will do some stuff. And it seems kind of silly, but it's kind of like one cloud provider putting stuff inside of another cloud provider and vice versa. It's probably gonna look really messy when it's all said and done because they're all going to, it's gonna be very incestuous. But you know, I feel like why wait until then, especially when you know, there's some things that we can benefit from right now. Thank you very much. Let's give him a round of applause.